Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this section, we will continue our discussion of thyroid disorders, turning our attention to hypothyroidism. In terms of definitions, I again highlight that we are talking about free T4. We can have a low total T4 if there is a decrease in TBG. Typical situations with a low TBG would include use of anti-seizure medications and glucocorticoids. We'll begin our review of hypothyroidism by focusing on the primary disorders. Primary, again, refers to end organ failure. It is characterized by a low free T4. The pituitary will respond to the low level of hormone by increasing TSH production. It is trying to stimulate a failed end organ to produce more hormone. Low T4, high TSH is the characteristic pattern of primary hypothyroidism. So which are the disorders you should be familiar with? Autoimmune thyroiditis, more familiar to us as Hashimoto's thyroiditis, and neonatal hypothyroidism, also called cretinism, are the two primary disorders you'll need to be familiar with. Before leaving this slide, and for extra emphasis, I have illustrated this failed thyroid gland, demonstrating the characteristic pathologic feature seen in Hashimoto's thyroiditis, that being the germinal center. If they describe a patient with hypothyroidism and ask you the likely pathologic finding, look for the answer which includes a germinal center. Note also the presence of the characteristic autoantibodies, antithyroid peroxidase antibody, and antithyroglobulin. As reviewed in the previous section, a patient may present with secondary hypothyroidism, that is, pituitary failure. They will still have a low free T4, but the pituitary has failed, so the TSH will also be low. So in what situation would you suspect pituitary failure as a cause for hypothyroidism? The most common scenario is ischemic necrosis or Sheehan syndrome. Your clue will be failure to lactate in the postpartum state. In these vignettes, the T4 will be low, the TSH will be low, and there will be no rise in either level following TRH stimulation. Definitely be familiar with this scenario. Before reviewing the disorders, let's be sure we understand the language of hypothyroidism. Patients will be described with abnormalities of metabolic rate, matrix tissues, and the adrenoreceptor. In terms of decreases in the basal metabolic rate, most are familiar with the idea of cold intolerance, weight gain, etc. I do want to draw your attention, however, to the presence of hypertension. Hypothyroidism may be associated with hypertension due to sodium retention. We'll compare and contrast that with myxedema coma in a moment when both the blood pressure and sodium are low. In terms of matrix accumulation, I think everyone is familiar with the notion of myxedema. I mention the mechanism not because they will ask, but to distinguish matrix accumulation in hypothyroidism from that in hyperthyroidism. That is, pretibial myxedema is seen in Graves' disease, a hyperthyroid condition. The matrix accumulation in Graves occurs by a different mechanism, and you shouldn't be confused to see pretibial myxedema, also known as dermatopathy, in Graves' disease. Insofar as the mechanism in hypothyroidism, thyroid hormone normally inhibits the synthesis of mucopolysaccharides and hastens their degradation. In hypothyroidism, therefore, the opposite occurs with increased synthesis and decreased clearance. Just for completeness, I include the typical symptoms of myxedema coma. This is an extreme form of hypothyroidism. Essentially, there is complete absence of hormone, in this instance, the patient experiences symptoms of hypothermia, hypotension, hyponatremia, and hypoglycemia. The hyponatremia is in part related to increased ADH from decreased renal perfusion and activation of central baroreceptors. That's just a big old FYI reinforcing what you've learned or will learn about ADH in subsequent sections. Let's turn our attention to the key disorders, starting with autoimmune thyroiditis. I use the term autoimmune since it informs us of the pathogenesis. So this is an autoimmune disorder with progressive destruction of the gland. Since the gland is destroyed, we won't see the trophic changes one would expect with a high TSH. 
The pathogenesis relates to breakdown in self tolerance to thyroid autoantigen. And here is the excellent news inciting events are uncertain, so they can't test you on those. So here's the money. The pathologic description. A typical question will give you signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism. They might even toss you some labs, such as the presence of autoantibodies, but then they will ask you to choose the correct pathologic description. So here it is, follicular atrophy and fibrosis. That's pretty nonspecific. However, the intense mononuclear infiltrate and well-formed germinal centers are very specific for Hashimoto's. Here is the image, but there are two further points you should be aware of that I'll illustrate on the next slides. First, germinal centers may also be seen in Graves' disease and lymphocytic thyroiditis, but both these conditions present with hyperthyroidism. The second point to be aware of regarding the pathologic findings in Hashimoto's is the presence of the hurdle cell. The hurdle cell represents a metaplastic response to ongoing injury of thyroid cuboidal epithelium. They may be described as epithelial cells with abundant eosinophilic granular cytoplasm, and they may also be seen in follicular adenomas or neoplasm. It isn't that the hurdle cell is so important to your life. It is unlikely you will see a question asking about these but should you see them, I don't want you to get confused about the Hashimoto question or descriptions. So the clinical presentation in autoimmune thyroiditis includes physical exam. The physical exam might include an enlarged non-tender gland, but in time and with fibrosis, the gland might even be shrunken. The vignettes almost always describe signs and symptoms of hypothyroidism, such as weight gain, fatigue, and cold intolerance. You should be aware that patients on occasion may initially present with a hyperthyroid phase referred to as Hashi toxicosis. Don't lose sleep on this one. As a clinical entity, it is indistinguishable from lymphocytic thyroiditis and will be included when we discuss hyperthyroidism. This is not a major player. As for diagnostics, not too much. The patient will have a low T4, high TSH. Autoantibodies will be present. Do be aware that the antibody on occasion is referred to as antimicrosomal, even though that phrase disappeared from clinical practice greater than 10 years ago. And mercifully, there are no characteristic imaging findings. Before using this occasion to review treatment, please note that Hashimoto's is associated with an increased risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma of the thyroid gland. Just be aware. Regarding treatment, T4, known as thyroxine, is the preferred agent. Even though it is a pro-hormone, the increased affinity for TBG gives it a prolonged half-life. Consequently, one's daily dosing is recommended. T3, also known as thyronine, has a shorter half-life owing to decreased binding to TBG and consequently re requires dosing two to three times a day. And finally, do be aware that autoimmune thyroiditis is associated with other autoimmune disorders, including endocrine and non-endocrine syndromes, such as lupus. Let's turn our attention to neonatal hypothyroidism, also called cretinism. Using the phrase cretinism gives me a clearer mental picture of the disorder compared with neonatal. There are essentially three key points with this disorder. The first and foremost being, this is a disorder of maternal hypothyroidism. The developing fetus has an absolute dependence on maternal T4 during the first 12 weeks of development. The manifestations of the disorder are related to maternal hypothyroidism during these 12 weeks. In terms of background, the hallmark is impaired development of the skeletal system and CNS. It is seen in iodine deficient regions. The pathogenesis reflects fetal dependence on maternal hormone, which readily crosses the placenta. The second key point reflects when the fetal thyroid gland starts synthesizing hormone. At 12 weeks, the fetus makes its own hormone, thus the dependence on the mom prior to this point in time. If there is maternal deficiency before development of fetal thyroid gland, mental retardation will develop. So the clinical features include coarse facial features, short stature, umbilical hernia, mental retardation, and protruding tongue. Under notes, I include if the mother develops hypothyroidism later in the pregnancy, 
after the fetal thyroid has become functional, there is no effect on brain development. This is to underscore the pathogenesis. It is those crucial first 12 weeks of brain development that the fetus counts on maternal hormone. And that concludes our discussion of hypothyroidism. In our next section, we'll tackle the inflammatory disorders causing hyperthyroidism. Thank you.